So welcome. This is the first of a series of talks and panel discussions that we're hosting in the lead up to the E17 Art Trail. Um, I'm Laura Kerry and my um, co-director Morag Maguire is here. Um, we have a theme for our work for the sort of two year period that we're in now called Possible Futures. And when we came up with that theme, um, the COVID world didn't exist. So um, the interpretations of possible futures are now uh, still many, but unexpected <laughs> um, and a, a, a very strange context indeed. So um, we have um, a series of these um, panel discussions with creative climate as the um, underpinning reason for bringing everyone together. And I felt quite strongly that there's so much information in the world at the moment we have access to, it's really overwhelming to know where to start. And right here in Walden Forest, we have creatives coming up with utterly ingenious ways of responding to climate crisis. And I think that's where we start. People that are working with materials, um, and reimagining them in exquisite ways and waste materials. So, um, so I will just give you an idea of what to expect today and I'll hand over in a moment to our chair, Sue Wheat and our panel. So um, the art trail announcements, we are running our festival that you may have heard of, the E17 Art Trail from the 3rd to the 20th of June next summer. And if you'd like to participate, um, please check out our website. I'll share the details in a moment. You can put your ideas in our website. There's a little form so we, you can introduce yourselves and we can find out what you're planning. That's especially helpful this year because we're trying to find new ways of sharing your work um, that might be alternative to large events, obviously. So do let us know what ideas are percolating. Um, we're going to launch a crowdfunder, so you um, can pre-book your event listings in the program for a reduced rate and look out for that on Friday next week. Then um, we have one-to-one -one sessions. You can book with me or my team every Tuesday and um, you can see those in our event right bookings and on our website. So you can get kind of detailed advice for your event. Um, so as I say, in a moment, I'll hand you over to Sue and we'll have a break in the middle, a comfort break. And at the end, please do um, join us. I'll invite you all up to talk amongst yourselves and socialise and try and recreate those amazing moments where you spark ideas off each other for future events. Um, so just checking my list of things because there's lots to say. Um, I, yeah, please just introduce yourselves and um, chat away and don't forget to put those questions to the panel so that I can pick them up and handing over to Sue. Thank you very much, panel. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Thank you. And welcome, everybody. Um, now, it might be a good idea to say that Morag is in the background uh, doing wonderful things, letting people in, all that sort of thing. So if anybody has a technical issue, is that okay if they send you a message, Morag, in the chat? Yeah, is that the best way to do it? Um, um, and we'll have people join us as, as we go along, I'm sure, which would be great. So welcome, everybody. I'm really excited to be hosting this today. And I've obviously spoken to the panelists, and, I'm, and I know you're in for a treat. Um, everybody's just doing such incredible work. And as Laura says, we're here to discuss and get inspiration about two of the most important issues in life, really. Um, how to use art in the most important time in history, dealing with the climate crisis. So, you know, I think the climate crisis can so often be just totally overwhelming. And the best way we have of, of dealing with it really is by finding the inspiration in life and art is, is obviously um, crucial to that. So thanks for coming. And we're so sorry that we can't see you in person. Um, there's actually me and Laura are in Gnome House on our own. We're in different corners of the, of the large room here. For those of you who live in Walthamstow, you'll know, know Gnome House. And hopefully next time we can 
all be together, but we're really grateful to you for coming and sitting on another Zoom call, but this is going to be really exciting. We're going to have lots of images of the work of the artists and uh, even a studio tour, so do, so do stay with us. Um, so I am going to move straight on to, uh, oh, first of all, let's just, just point out that there is a chat function and there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So the chat function is for you to just chat amongst yourselves and share useful links and you know uh, comments and things. But the Q and A is for you to put forward questions for the speakers, who will collate and then we'll we'll use those later on to and put them to them um, towards the end. So so do use both of those functions. Okay, so our first uh, guest is Sandy Sutton. And she's a sculptor and an artist turning discarded waste into things of beauty, uh, all focused on nature. So give us a wave, Sandy, just in case people can't see you in the gallery. Give us a wave. Yeah, great. Um, I'm sure you're, uh, hopefully you're, you're big on everybody's screen now, but um, thank you for joining us, Sandy. And as um, you know, I live in Waltham Forest, I've come across your work already and it is just beautiful can you just describe oh. to people what you do and what you make and give them a bit of a flavor okay oh, thank you and thank you for inviting me to speak on the panel that's a pleasure um, the work that i've been doing is using lots of the found reclaimed plastics that i found roundabouts in walthamstow in the skips and things that are brought into me just uh, the waste plastics that everybody's thinking well where's that going and you know making sure it gets used again to create artworks that I can then get a, a bigger message across with I hope. <laughs> and how long have you been doing it for? Tell us a bit about your journey. Oh I've um, I was well as a child I was always that child that drew um, I sort of would be drawing and looking under rocks and stones in the garden looking for bugs and things I always had that those two key interests ever since I was a child was the was the art the drawing and the uh, natural history I then went on to study arts at, uh, at university and then carried on from there yeah it's it's always been an interest tying the two together, tying my art practice and getting something across that has a, a, an impact that can so you, lead to some change. Yeah. And you've always worked with discarded materials, have you? Um, to start with, yes. I mean, as you see with this piece here, this was my early, very early work. I, I focused on um, mythology and migration trails of animals, it's always, the animals have always been a, a very key feature. And this was uh, a piece I made for a public sculpture using discarded wooden pieces. And uh, I think there's an old bike seat in there and uh, tires obviously. And, and this was also a, a sculpture that animals could live in. It would, would had sort of uh, the holes for insects and bugs. How, and, how big is that? Because I mean, it, it looks huge. It is huge. It's is that, is that the, <laughs> it's huge. It's, over, it's almost, oh, what, sort of two, two metres? It's really tall. Um, and what is the, the huge bit of wood? How did you find that? Uh, it's an old sleeper that had yes. been discarded. Yeah, sort of railway and, sleeper. And where is the sculpture now? Where, where did it get? Uh, it's at uh, the school grounds at a school in Gladstone Park. In Waltham Forest? No, this one's out in Brent. Okay, one. all right, okay. And so, yeah, just talk us through how you actually, um, you know, reclaim everything. Do you, do you go around with a big van or <laughs> you got a trolley? Or... <laughs> no, because uh, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a big van. I go around, you know, I've got um, bags that I sort of have tucked away in my back rucksack and uh, anything I see I collect or um, sometimes, you know, I will talk a friend into going and picking things up and dropping them in the back of the car. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Particularly good school times. 
<laughs> particularly what sorry particularly good you know big skip finds yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's that's that can be used I'm sure loads of people can relate to that because uh, I'm a skip hunter. I'm sure, I know lots of skip hunters. We're, we're a breed, aren't we? We are. Um, and what's, what's on screen now? Oh, uh, this was part of uh, another looking at, at the way that um, birds in particular, um, that we share them with, you know, other countries. They have no borders, as we know. And this was a project linking um, the Hooper Swan migration between the UK and Iceland, they come oh, wow. across every year and then they fly back to Iceland um, in the summer, their summer. And I think and that the, the disc at the end of this picture, I think is the artwork, is it? Yes, yeah, sorry, yes. Yeah. This is yeah. at, the, at the wetland centre in Welney where the, the swans come over. So it was just to, for me to make sure that these corridors of migration were that people were aware that they are sharing these birds and to, to look after look after that uh, environment. So has a concern for climate always been something that you've dealt with in your art or has it progressed from sort of environmental issues and nature into a, into a Yes, it has progressed from environmental issues and nature because you see with some of the earliest works I, I was using lots of farm materials and a lot of those pieces were plastic and it was that point I started thinking well where does this plastic go you know how's it produced because there's just so much of it and then I found out that it wasn't going anywhere and it was like oh my goodness this is horrifying you know this is using up fossil fuels to create it it's it pollutes in the environment and this was over oh my goodness this was over 25 years ago We've so got through a lot of plastic in that time haven't we we have it's, indeed. It's, yes. um, it's, it's still unthinkable, with us. really. <laughs> it's, yeah. a, it's a worrying thing. So that was when I started focusing on that and, and the effect it was having on the environment and trying to do what I could to highlight that message to a, a wide audience. So and this, this is the organisations as well. Sorry, yes, yes, yeah. Uh, just before we move on from this slide, this is the what we could see at the end of that um, picture of the bird watchers, wasn't it? But this, yeah, yes, this, this is, is it. Where this it shows main the, um, the plastic, is it? This is something else. This was uh, it was the scrap woods, and because this was going to be going, to be going outside for indefinitely <laughs> a long period of time, you know, this this piece wasn't plastic. Um, this yeah. was a plaster piece. And it, so now you're, you're working exclusively in plastic or a combination of materials? I'm just thinking um, predominantly in plastic, but then if I find other pieces that I can use or, you know, that have been discarded, you know, I will use the wood. Um, I use, yeah, this one's all plastic. Yeah, I can see. I mean, this is fantastic, isn't it? I mean, not only is it the most beautiful sort of sculpture of an incredib incredibly lifelike bird, but is it perched on a typewriter's <laughs> thing? No, what it is, okay. it's actually uh, something I picked up on uh, Black Horse Lane, which was oh, where yeah. the casing of somebody's, uh, one of the lorries that had been by one of the vans had ah. been knocked out. It's, it's the front light. All oh, right. Okay. It's quite big. Yeah. Okay. So, and I mean, it, it works perfectly, doesn't it? And, and what about the bird itself? How did you create the bird? Uh, the bird is using, again, all the found plastics, uh, waste. Uh, I think there's lots of uh, old bleach bottles in there and a lot of household detergent bottles coat hangers, you know, pegs. Yeah. Unfortunately, I am sport for choice. What's, what are its Over feet? Uh, its feet are pegs, razor blade hand, handles, um, hair clips. Wow. Know, just... And so you do a lot of your work with, uh, you do a lot of workshops with schools, don't you? I'm sure that children just absolutely yeah. love seeing these. 
Yes. Yeah, they do. Yeah, because they're, they're so colourful. Um, they're drawn into to the yeah. pathway. And, you know, a lot of children are very involved in, you know, enjoy world life and, and the uh, natural world. So it, tell us tell us a bit about this one. I loved this one, uh, Susan. As oh, right. this, was, this was a very early, this was in fact one of my first ones that was put on show. And again, it was, um, I was concerned about, you know, looking, if you look at a small part of in, uh, what's happening in environment, you know, that if the frogs are really struggling through um, loss of habitat and that then opens up a whole area. So I just wanted to focus on this particular frog um, and then use all the plastics that um, I found uh, around round and about, things that have just been disposed of or that people handed in. That are, it's are it's not incredible, isn't it? That, a lot of them. It's so incredible that sorry. rubbish is, sorry, sorry to interrupt. This is the problem with Zoom, isn't it? Sorry. I know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's incredible that rubbish can look so beautiful. That's what I was going to say. All right. Yeah. I mean, part of that is I wanted them to look attractive. So you do look into them because the reality of what is happening is so horrific. It can be very hard to look at. So I think making them very accessible and beautiful is a, another way into looking at the issue. Um, and then seeing things that you recognize, all the little tops off the baby's feeding bottle, feeding smoothies and toys, tops, you know, so it, it, and then making that connection. So who's, who was this uh, piece made for, or is it just something that you've made and then exhibited? It was a piece that I made and then an exhibition came up about landscape and it went into that as sort of quite a small exhibition. This is, let's say this is a, quite a, an old piece. This is quite a few years old. Yeah. And it also, I think it then went into a Wildlife Artists of the Year exhibition as well. And they were starting to include work. So that. you're obviously collaborating with people all the time, aren't you? Um, you know, you're, you're, you're finding artistic avenues and then yes. collaborating with, with the organisers, but also with other artists. Can you talk us through a bit of, about how you work? Yeah, I... I do collaborate with other artists on some of the, uh, the big, big, bigger projects and exhibitions um, where we each are putting our own individual input into it. And then, for example, with this piece here, which was part of uh, Street Pianos, um, this was a collaboration with the Street Pianos in Canary Wharf to encourage people to play the piano when they're out and about but also you know it's looking at you know the amount of rubbish is that a usable piano then that can they actually can they uh yes it was it, it was yes it's, it's just a school now. beautiful <laughs> it's what sorry uh it then went on to a school oh how fantastic i bet the kids loved it yeah. So, so what's the response from children and how do you how do you manage that conversation between you know, we're going to make something beautiful out of rubbish and the climate crisis, which is obviously such a big deal um, and difficult to talk to children about, isn't it? So, Yes, it's, I approach it by, you know, showing what I've done and then finding out what they know. You know, they tell me, you know, I so said, what do you think this might be about and why do you think I made it? And, and they do know, you know, they're, they're very, they're a lot of, the children are very aware and make yeah. those connections and then when I work with you know we are using their toys quite often to create more permanent artworks to go oh, into really the yeah because you, you ask children to bring in yeah yeah toys. all those bits that fall to the bottom of the toy box and yeah 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 what a brilliant way of using them. And I bet you're very popular with the parents, actually. 
<laughs> well, it depends, you know, because there's some but some children, you know, they haven't played with those toys for a very long time. But as soon as you think, oh, they might be going, you might take them away. They're sort of and they're going to be made into a to let them go. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's so, so this is is this um, wasp from the wonderful exhibition you did with others at the Vestry Museum? Or is this yes. another one? Yes, this is from the, the Swarm exhibition at Vestry House on the pollinator crisis um, to highlight the issues surrounding that, uh, which was a fantastic exhibition to be involved in and artists I really respect. It really and, was stunning, wasn't it? And um, so good to have something in Walthamstow in such a beautiful natural, I mean, it has got a beautiful natural space, hasn't it? The Vestry Museum, yeah. So, yeah. which is probably planted for pollinating plants and all that sort of thing. So it was so apt, wasn't it? It was such a perfect location. And uh, like you say, um, various other artists involved who had done incredible work. But mm. just, just t tell us, so just tell us what the bits of the, of the wasp are. I'm very intrigued. Oh, let me see. Um, there was the shopping trolley that I found again on Mill on uh, Black Horse Lane that had been discarded. Uh, that I liked because it had the uh, the same pattern that a uh, paper wasp makes. And then there's coat hangers from the market. Um, what are its antennae? Its antennae are, I think. They were window wipers. I'm trying to remember. And then there's some plastic spoons that came. Um, there's the. Sorry, I'm doing this. This is the eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think were those um, special scrunchy brushes that you get, the uh, Tangle Tees brushes. All oh, right. Uh, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Bottles. Yeah. <laughs> Rest is bottles. Ah, I have a technical issue. I just have to. I just have to intercept and ask Laura to bring me the power lead because my battery is running low. So that wouldn't be very good, would it? Um, um, but yeah, hopefully I won't get a cut off in, in the next few seconds. If I do, then you'll know why. Um, is it as simple as that? Do I just have to press it in? Let's hope that that works all oh, I think that's worked because the screen's gone brighter now that's brilliant um Sandy I'm gonna have we're gonna have to uh, uh leave you until later I think and then we'll all come you know all the artists will come back and um, right. discuss Thank together you. and everybody who's listening oh final slide which is um actually <laughs> let's just talk about this because um uh this is a an award you did for Ashton recently isn't it and yes, you did, it was, you did a series. Of, sorry, you did twelve. <laughs> one yes. of twelve. Yes, yes. Um, to to give the amazing award winners for the sustainability awards prize, yeah. um, trophy awards, uh, using again everything that I found round about in Walthamstow, including gas, uh, old gas pipe that is uh, the circle. Um, and each one has the circle, doesn't it? So it has the continuity. Yeah. It has the continuity and it has that, yeah. you know, because it's sustainability that, you know, to use that as a symbol for a circular economy. Yeah. And the little bird of hope. Oh, and, yeah, how um, beautiful. What, when I saw them, it actually brought tears to my eyes. I have to oh, say that. Darling. <laughs> I'm, I'm very easily moved. No, I mean, it was, uh, it was, they were brilliant. Um, Thank you. So actually, before you go, I think... I'm right in thinking that we are going to take a few direct questions to you. Is that is that right? Okay. We've got some. Um, so somebody said, "How do you attach all the plastic bits together? Glue or heat?" Some are with heat, and some I'm actually I use bolts and screws. I uh -huh. use I bolt I bolt pieces together. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. And there's some I can use. Um, I cut wire and twist and some i mean some of your sculptures are small right and some of them are really huge yeah so that that must take a whole range of different sort of tools and skills really yes i use rivet guns as well um 
and do occasional have... cable tie, which I'm trying to not use at all for obvious reasons, but yeah. Unless you find them on the street. <laughs> uh, yeah, or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although cable ties are one of those things that you can't use properly more than once, aren't they? Yeah. Um, okay, well, let's, let's move on because, uh, you know, you've given us a really great taster to start the webinar off with. Thank you, Sandy. Yeah. Thank you. And we will, uh, if you can stay, I hope you can, and uh, we'll come back to That's sort it. of joint questions with all of the, um, with you and the other panelists. Now, one thing I realized that I didn't do um, at the beginning was to introduce all the other panelists as well. So I'm just going to, we're, we're going to move on to Francesco Mazzarella. Um, and I just want to sort of give a brief introduction of um, the other artists as well. So um, Francesca will talk to you shortly. We've also got Olivia Weber here, um, who's, yeah, thanks for waving, who runs Trash and Factory and works uh, closely with Frances Francesco. And um, so you're both in the fashion world, aren't you? Um, and we've got Lucy Latham from Julie's Bicycle which is a, um, a fantastic nationwide organization bringing um, arts organizations together with a focus on uh, addressing the climate crisis. So it's gonna be really great to talk to you Lucy, later and get that sort of national perspective as well. So um, Francesco, hi, how are you? Hi, I'm good, I'm very excited. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. No, um, it's great. It's great to see you. And um, before we've got a, a wonderful, um, we've got a wonderful uh, video that we're going to be playing of yours in just a second. But I'll just introduce you first. So um, uh, correct me if I get any of it wrong, but hopefully I won't. So uh, Francesco Mazzarella is a re so research uh, fellow in fashion and design for social change at the Center for Sustainable Fashion. Uh, UAL, which is, remind me what UAL stands University for. University of the Arts London. Yes. And you're currently the re lead researcher on the Making for Change Waltham Forest project, which we're going to um, see in the video and hear more about, which is aimed at exploring ways in which fashion and making can be used as catalysts for positive change and activating legacies within the local community. And it's, I mean, it's really inspiring your work because you're, you're, properly in there with the community, aren't you? And you're, you're doing such exciting projects. So um, uh, if, it's, if it's okay, Laura, are we gonna play the, um, the video? So hang in there while we get that sorted. Making for Change Waltham Forest is a partnership project between uh, London College of Fashion and Waltham Forest Council. And uh, do you remember, Laura, how did it all start? I bumped into Lorna Lee, who's the Director of Culture and Heritage for London Borough of Waltham Forest. And we started talking about London Borough of Culture and how it might be a great opportunity for London College of Fashion to start a sort of partnership or a collaboration with the borough. This project uses fashion and making to activate uh, a positive change in the borough, but also with a long-term legacy. It comprises a programme of activities in relation to education, manufacturing, community engagement. And for London College of Fashion, it's a real opportunity for us to connect to local schools. This resource for 16 to 18 year olds, it offers um, an opportunity for students to engage in what sustainability means. So it's about looking at what is going on in fashion now and what will happen in 2030. The team has come in from London College of Fashion with a great deal of resources which we'll be able to use for the future. And that also raises possibilities, aspiration, maybe even understanding what careers might look like in, in different industries like fashion. It's fulfilling a gap and a need but also encouraging other learning. So the other key strand was manufacturing, wasn't it? So we had a great opportunity to uh, have three members of staff at the London College of Fashion to undertake residencies in uh, fashion design and manufacturing businesses. So one of these researchers is looking into recommendations for policy for sustainable fabric manufacturing. 
another one is exploring sustainable innovation and technology, and another is about revitalizing craft heritage skills. In the shoe trade, all of your shoes are made on different shapes, and I have to make the shapes which cut the shoes out. I'm the only person in London now trying to keep the thing going. I've contacted local schools um, for young people to come to workshops with Steve to see what he does and hopefully they'll be inspired to continue on this legacy of creating a product that will last their whole life. So of course community engagement is really important to us. We have empowered people to actually enhance their well-being, learn new skills and contribute to sustainability. Tackling social issues like deprived youth, uh, skills shortage, fashion manufacturing decline and unemployment. This project is about empowering women and kind of teaching them how to make coats either for themselves or for donating them. We really want to teach them is how to make a jacket that's really kind of a multi-use. You then can reverse so you can kind of wear it in multiple ways. It's probably also easier if you have multiple children and different outfits. As a parent, as a resident, what I can say bringing into Wolfram Forest, skill, unity, creating a bond among women. This is a very powerful thing. And then of course there's the opening of the first fashion hub at Arbite Studios at Leighton Green which will provide long lasting legacy for local employment but also for our students as well. Let's see if Laura can work any magic and if not, well we can talk over it can't we until it starts again. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Um, so tell us a bit about your journey, Francesco. I mean, you're Italian. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> and um, you're here working on sustainable fashion, but you're also an academic, right? So tell us a bit about, yeah, your journey. Yeah. As you can imagine, I am uh, from Italy, from Sicily, exactly. And I think in a way, maybe craftsmanship and material culture, uh, it's always been in, in my DNA uh, I, as being Italian. Uh, when I was 18, I moved to Turin in the north of Italy, where I studied product design. And then I did a master in sustainable design. As well, I must say that I'm not trained in fashion, um, but uh, I actually, I remember when I was very young, I wanted to be an artist because I, lo I, li I love the drawings but then as I grew a bit older then I talked about architecture because I don't feel I'm a genius of creativity with like paintings and stuff but then at the open days I also discovered the uh, product design and I felt it was the best fit for me because it is more logical uh, problem about problem solving but also um, related to uh, beauty and the uh, material culture of a place and as well in my studies, um, it is always very much focused on sustainability. At Politecnico di Torino, we have a master in sustainable design, and we look at the journey uh, of the flows of resources and how waste can become uh, resources for uh, open systems. Um, and as well, I also like traveling a lot. So in my master's, I wasn't satisfied enough to stay just in Turin. So I spent one semester in the Netherlands where I also learned about uh, uh, user-centered design, um, design futures. And then I did my dissertation in, um, in Brazil where I was working on design for social innovation uh, with uh, crafts communities. Um, actually, I think that was the a key point that marked my uh, career. I really much, um, I became uh, less and less bored, uh, uh, more and more bored to produce uh, yet another product that may be uh, produced in an unsustainable way and also uh, leads to overconsumption. So instead of really focusing on products, I, did, I was interested in service design, which means um, looking at the system uh, and the service and the strategies that allow that still uh, are enabled through some products, but actually for me it was important to link it back to sustainability and social innovation. And, uh, and then I decided to move uh, to, as well, I was working in industry in a design company uh, in Turin, uh, but uh, I wasn't satisfied enough uh, by the uh, fast speed of producing. And uh, even if it was graphic design to be more um, digital and less uh, uh, resource intensive still, uh, I wanted to have a more long-term vision and uh, make a more um, 
a greater impact in the community where I work. So I decided to um, look at the DESIS network, which is an international network of uh, university lab uh, focused on design for social innovation and sustainability. And, uh, and I decided to uh, do a PhD um, at Loughborough Design School funded by the AHRC. Uh, which is the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And through my PhD, we looked at um, uh, co-designing services and strategies for the sustainability and social innovation uh, of textile crafts communities. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, am I interrupting again? I was, I was just gonna say, before we sort of lose the, um, the, the momentum of the film that we've just seen, although we did, didn't see it all, I think, um, Laura's probably put up the link so that people can go back to that film um, themselves. But just tell us a bit about, about what we saw there, because it, it was, you know, obviously very hands-on. So you've got an academic background, an industrial background, but what you, you're doing now is you're combining your, um, your learning from those two fields into uh, community sort of work, aren't you? Yeah. So just, just talk us through that. Yeah, uh, as well, the project, I was so lucky to uh, be involved in this project. Uh, since the beginning, I joined the Center for Sustainable Fashion. Uh, my postdoc was about fashion activism. That means challenging the status quo and create uh, change within the unsustainable fashion industry. Um, and as some of you may know, uh, at the moment, London College of Fashion has six buildings uh, scattered around the city. But we're moving to the Olympic Park in 2023. So I'm part of a committee which is focused on East London engagement. So we don't want to be parachuted into East London without any resonance or connection to the local community. But it is very much, we're working uh, really much on uh, activating, making connections with those organizations. And through that, I got in touch with the uh, Waltham Forest Council, uh, who back then was becoming uh, the very first London Borough of Culture in 2019. And I met uh, Laura and Morag as well, and many other creatives around the uh, uh, borough uh, that actually and together we shaped the proposal so as well I think very interesting was um, even the way we uh, designed the proposal was that I undertook a residency from three months so I was a researcher from the town hall um, co-designing the project itself with different departments and I think as well what was successful was joining as you may know like working in a local authority it's always very much fragmented but we managed to uh, join together the the Department of Culture, Education, Regeneration and Business Growth. And uh, you, you, found, you found the magic, the magic solution, didn't you? I, I think you could sell yourself to every single council in the country for, <laughs> for having worked that out, you know. Well, I We've wish. been trying to do that for a long time. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, as well for me, my methodology in being a researcher is participatory action research. So it is about uh, uh, developing theory through the action and actually it's a collaborative practice with different uh, uh, stakeholders. Um, yes, as you say, it is very hands-on, it comprises many activities, um, so education as you saw in the film, um, manufacturing and also community engagement which is actually the, the core of my work. Uh, yeah. when I use, and it's about using fashion to activate social change in people and communities. Brilliant, well I think that I mean, what we're going to do, um, we're going to have a break now and then we're going to come back to you and Olivia, um, yeah. because you, that, that, that's exactly what you've d done, isn't it, together, is collaborated together on a, on a, a community project. So, um, if everybody, so everybody's free to go <clears throat> for 10 minutes and, you know, get yourself a drink or, or whatever, but you're also really fr free to stay and chat. So I'll hand you over to Laura, who's going to explain how that's going to work. Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, so we're going to go back to Francesco's film to see the bit that uh, we got to before it froze. Um, so Laura, if, if you can uh, press play, let's see if it works. So the main elements of the partnership plan are between London College of Fashion, Fashion District, and uh, Waltham Forest Council are really around how we can help businesses thrive and the fashion industry grow within the borough. We are in the heart of Leighton here in an old supermarket and what transformation it's had into the Arbeit Studios Leighton Green. It's full of creatives, it's providing a presence on our high street. People are walking past and staring 
and it's a fantastic transformation for this area. The project provides a great model for us to use going forward with other partners, particularly in relation to our move to Stratford. Yeah, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Waltham Press Council, the London Borough of Culture, the Great Place Scheme, and everybody really working on this project, students, staff, the local community, the businesses. <coughs> it's been a great opportunity, actually. I agree, it's fantastic. It's a great you. film. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, and uh, Olivia is uh, was in the film, and um, and you two have worked together a lot. So maybe you can, um, well, welcome Olivia, um, and um, maybe maybe we can start with you just uh, explaining a bit about Trash and Factory, and uh, but then both of you sort of explaining how you're working together because I think this is really interesting you know, to just learn about how people collaborate, really. But um, if you give us an intro first, Olivia, that'd be great. Um, yeah, so I studied at London College of Fashion and Francesca was actually my tutor. Um, and I guess then I had like, at the college, I had great experiences working in for making for change while volunteering and doing like my first very informal creative workshops for a project called Procession. And I think that's when I kind of really realized the power of social change and craft and how, yeah, just kind of working directly with people can be very, very powerful for them, but also for myself and for our community. Um, and then I finished my master's. So I studied the MA Fashion Future, so sustainable fashion. Um, I was always really yeah into sustainability, obviously like changing climate change and all of that. Um, and then after I've studied, um, Francesco started the Making for Change Walton Forest project and he asked me to uh, do some workshops at Forest Recycling Project. Um, and this, I was really grateful for this because I had just uh, finished my studies. I kind of knew I wanted to maybe do have a, my own brand, but you know, you just kind of finished and you don't really know how to start this journey as a grown up, <laughs> I guess. So that was really great. And I never really thought I would like teaching workshops that much, but now it's really one of my favorite things to do. Um, and then from that first, I think we did workshops like zero, zero waste pattern cutting and mending workshops and then yeah Francesco just approached me after that as well. yeah exactly natural dyes as well um yeah and then they had this great project idea for the forest coats and because Francesco knew that in my um, MA project I had worked with a lot of coats so I tried to develop four different kind of ideas of how coats are made and how small details of what materials we use and how we develop the patterns can make our world more sustainable. Um, yeah, yeah. Beautiful. And you're, you're in your studio, aren't you? So yeah, maybe we could have a sneak, sneak look around. Would that be all right? Yeah, of course. So um, actually then after starting to do the workshops, I decided that I wanted to um, start a community interest company called Trash and Factory. Um, and what I do here is I do take like old stuff from trades that is kind of in the defect piles, you know, like jeans that have like broken crotches and like just holes everywhere, but they still have really, really good parts that are really functional. And then I am currently developing my first um, product and it's kind of a workwear jacket. Mm -hmm. um, Lovely. Made all from... Wow. Yeah, the, the trousers. And it's really just incredible how much you can make from something that would have just ended up on landfill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Beautiful. They're so beautiful. And then and if the, you just want to have like a little look, I just have like a little sewing machine here. Uh-huh. 
my overlock, uh, my iron. It's really a very like small studio just for me starting out the heat it's press. Got everything you need. Yeah, my little trashable sign. <laughs> and where and, do you get the, the um, materials from? Where do you get the um, clothes from? Is it just? So actually, I because I'm in the Arbeit Studios Leighton Green and they sometimes have workshops here and um, Trade came to kind of deliver a sewing workshops and I started talking with them and they then invited me to just go to their warehouse in West London and go through their defect piles. So yeah, I've been doing that. And then obviously now when, you, when people that know you or are around your community and they know that you take old clothes. They just, you know, I have too much stuff to be honest always. <laughs> so I don't know if I've just missed something very important about Waltham Forest. And I, I had no idea that your that this um, location existed until I, I uh, spoke to Francesca and read about, you know, the stuff that you've been doing together. So, yeah. so it's at Baker's Arms, right? And it's not yeah. supermarket? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, uh, it was a Morrison supermarket, which was empty for over one and a half years. So actually through the borough culture, when I was also um, doing the residency to understand, for now I was starting, for, I was working from the town hall, but actually we felt the need to also give to this project a physical presence, a place from, where, from which I could deliver all these workshops and exhibitions and symposia. But actually as well, no, uh, quite soon, I also realized that I didn't want to uh, become the manager of a 300 square meters old supermarket. I had my own office at Center for Sustainable Fashion, but also considering um, how, uh, how many artists are really struggling to find us affordable workspace, we then decided to partner with um, Arbeit Studios. Who, um, it's an organization that runs lots of co-working spaces across London. So actually the role that we have in terms, as you also asked about partnerships, for us, it was really creating a partnerships between uh, London College of Fashion, uh, Waltham Forest Council, Arbeit Studios, and also Fashion District. And we all provided consultations. And in the end, the best option was to for Arbeit Studios to manage the space and uh, with our support as well, we um, promoted it to our fashion businesses that we knew. So, for example, I invited Olivia to take one of the studios. And, uh, but also, especially given the nature of the project about culture and community, we actually wanted to reserve the, um, a big, uh, large area at the entrance for community um, project. And it's also a gallery where uh, I did uh, two exhibitions. Um, we're doing workshops and artists in residence uh, and other activities like that. So as well to keep a good balance between businesses. There are 11 businesses uh, active at the moment and also this communal area where lots of exciting stuff happened, COVID allowing, of course. That's amazing. I don't know. I, I, I mean, I'm often at uh, the Hornbeam and Forest Recycling Project. So okay. I'm, I'm really <laughs> disgusted with myself for not knowing about you guys. And, you know, I mean, I thought we should put a little shout out to FRP Forest Recycling Project and Elizabeth, who's currently running it but obviously FRP has been going on go, been going for so long yeah. and they were the real trailblazers in this really weren't they yes yeah, um, all the fabrics we use they come from them and as well we have an amazing partnerships uh, so at the moment for example we so we did forest coats uh, as part of the um, um, London Borough culture and actually it was so successful that uh, uh, three women got employment uh, also Olivia informed by the learning from this experience decided to shift her business model into that of a community interest company so that she continue can continue working with the uh, women from the community um, and uh, this year uh, we got follow-on funding from the council to deliver forest kimonos so that we want to keep engaged with our community but also providing them with opportunities to learn more advanced skills so they're doing zero waste pattern cutting which is olivia's specialism and they're making they're upcycling the fabrics from frp uh, to make kimonos for themselves um they, and here olivia can show you something uh, quite amazing from got, like a little example uh -huh. um, it's still in the making. We still have some sessions to go. Uh -huh. um, Angelica's kimono. And I think it used to be, this bit used to actually be like a dress. So then she's kind of repurposed it into a sleeve. And yeah. Brilliant. 
So why kimonos? Um, I think it's because it's a, it's kind of a simple first introduction to zero waste pattern cutting. It's not too hardcore. You can get your head around it. And it's a beautiful item to make kind of for yourself, you know, something that you can wear at home or in summer. Yeah. It's very personal. So really yeah, nice for the women to kind of take the time out and create something for themselves. I think that's so important. Yeah. I want to say also that uh, actually Forest Coats is part of a bigger initiative we have at the LCF called 1000 Coats. Um, in the lineup to our move to Stratford in 2023, uh, there is the idea that eventually uh, we will produce uh, 1000 children's coats. Uh, but actually, through the opportunity of my project, we created a for a uh, Walton Forest fashion of it called the Forest Coats. And, um, and as well, at the, through the evaluation and talking to the women, they also, for, uh, at first, they made uh, coats for their children or for donation to the Baby Bank Scheme at Priory Courts Community Center. But they were all very interested in pattern cutting and especially zero waste pattern cutting to be more sustainable. And then also, after they made um, clothes for their children, we also thought it would be nice for them to make something for themselves. Um, so that's why uh, how it came about and okay. as well through as well using existing assets and resources and people so the specialism of uh, Olivia as well as the materials from FRP and the space of the fashion hub it all just came together quite magically. It does sound magical actually it really does. Um, I just want to so I put in the chat that we would go to Q&A, but I am conscious that we are at 3.35 and I had said that we'd speak to Lucy at this point. So um, it might be good if we have a, a bit of a chat with Lucy first and if everybody can, um, if you've got questions, do put them in the Q&A and then um, we can either read them out or people can actually, you know, just we can go to the the all attendee forum and people can just chat as well but um maybe we can go to lucy and then come back to um all the panelists again um because i'm sure that people will have loads of, of questions and i want to make sure that we've got time for those um so thank you um francesco and um and olivia we'll we'll we'll, we'll come back to you in a second but lucy hi hi how are you I'm good, thank you. How are you? Hi. Uh, great, I'm, I'm great I'm session. I'm around in this very big room. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. So you're from Julie's Bicycle. Um, great name. <laughs> and perhaps you can introduce, your, you know, the organisation to everybody first, just in case they haven't come across you. Uh, yeah, sure. Can so you? Uh, can you hear me? Just checking. Yeah. Yep. 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 Great. Yep. Um, so yeah, Julie's Bicycle, uh, we actually work internationally, um, so hopefully uh, not yes. only a national perspective, um, across the creative sector to reduce environmental impacts and support the cultural community to underpin its work with environmental values from the governance and strategy in cultural buildings to the uh, production and practices of artists an artistic practice, uh, festivals, cultural policy and funding, uh, all are sort of included um, within that. Um, and I thought I'd kind of give um, a kind of reflection on the sort of things that, that we're thinking about um, internally at the moment. I just want to say though, uh, so brilliant to see all the presentations today. They're such, uh, everyone is such, um, fantastic speaker and bringing such um, a brilliant perspective. And I love the fact that we're talking about consumption because I'm actually in the process of moving house. And I think there's nothing like moving house to make you realize how much crap that you've accumulated over a really long period of time. Uh, because I don't like throwing things away because I feel guilty, so I keep them. And I found the most uh, ridiculous number of incredibly old, pointless possessions. And all it makes me think is that we have to really, really challenge um, our consumption habits. And I think arts and culture is a great conduit uh, to that. So, I, I yeah, I just wanted to myself just to really. Oh, so, 
very bad feedback there. Sorry about that. <laughs> I've always said to myself that I think everybody should be forced to move every five years. But then I got way over that stage in my house and I realized that I, I just couldn't face it. But I think it, that's probably what we need to do, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think I probably will never do it. Never do it again, actually. <laughs> and just live with my stuff. Um, so I wanted to start by, I guess, kind of sharing a reflection um, on this quite momentous um, period of time. This is a really profound moment of uh, flux and change uh, across the board. And the decisions that we are making now, the conversations we're having, they have such significant consequences. The cultural sector continues to be hugely impacted uh, by COVID-19 and lockdown, and the shock waves of this pandemic are going to be felt for years and years to come. Um, there is an obvious need to resume quickly and safely, and a recovery plan for the sector um, is essential. But this really provides us with a kind of window of, of opportunity to really think about what a resilient and long term recovery plan looks like um, that includes or is underpinned by the climate and ecological crisis. Um, and if you're still keeping an eye on Europe and things happening uh, at sort of European level, I think the European Green Deal is a very good example of this thinking. Um, however, I would sort of add that a lot of these sort of big picture sort of policy frameworks, they are, uh, we still have a lot to be sort of uh, kind of critical about. Uh, these are kind of battlegrounds of ideas. Um, and I'll kind of come back to that, that point. Um, Another sort of key thing that we are thinking a lot about in Julie's Bicycle is um, social justice. So the pandemic, um, as we know, as well as the kind of uh, justice movements like Black Lives Matter, have been further, further exposing the structural injustice in workplaces and across society. And of course, arts and culture is, is no exception. Climate and social justice are deeply interconnected. Uh, the most disadvantaged people in the world who are generally uh, responsible for the least emissions are also the most vulnerable uh, to its impacts. And that's what we mean when we're using this frame, uh, climate justice. And even in more sort of industrialized um, economies, these inequalities revealed by COVID-19 map directly across to climate and nature inequalities, um, with poorer communities having less access to green space, um, housing with environmental factors like insulation or allotments, gardens for growing food. Uh, they're more likely to be in pollution hotspots. And these are often the voices that are most powerless and marginalized. So we have to kind of remember when we're also thinking about what uh, green recovery um, or any kind of recovery looks like, that we need to analyze our uh, projects and our plans and our activities through this kind of justice lens. Because for many, uh, there is going to be no appetite for dealing with further crisis. Um, but crisis is unfortunately uh, what we are in and regarding climate and the ecological crisis, we are a long way from limiting warming to 1.5 degrees, as is our uh, sort of policy mandate. Uh, we're currently on a pathway to over three degrees, um, and we have until around sort of the, the 2050 mark at the latest to reach net zero emissions globally. So this is a kind of monumental transition well, the IPCC, the International, um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they've said this change needs to affect everyone and everything. So it's kind of a case of reimagining, reconfiguring everything that we know, um, and getting us sort of back on even track to these targets. That's only possible if we really start reducing now and half by 2030. And we can't forget, uh, the news probably <laughs> won't let us forget, that we have some pretty dubious world leaders, but we cannot let um, 
this 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 stop us and i really do believe that the people in this sector offer an extraordinary array of talents and skills which really has the power to change the public uh, conversation around these issues um, and at julie's bicycle uh, we're kind of using these four frames of reference to guide our work um, over the next period of time and and those four lenses are decarbonization so the immediate rapid urgent reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in order to meet net zero circularity a waste-free economy that is moving us away from excessive consumption uh, particularly of finite resources and i think that's a theme that's come through a lot uh, today. Um, justice, ensuring that um, no person or place is left behind in this transition. That's the kind of status quo, um, uh, relatively bureaucratic um, kind of idea of justice. I, I think it's actually a much more uh, radical redistribution of resources, but in terms of how we are uh, using that justice lens, um, I guess it perhaps fits the the um, that earlier description, and then lastly, nature. So, how are we really restoring and protecting our bio biodiversity and uh, our natural heritage? And over the next nine months, we're going to be looking at these sort of big policy frameworks, these big issues, and seeing how they map against um, cultural practice, um, particularly uh, across the the UK and. Uh, within the Arts Council um, England portfolio, as that is one of our flagship contracts uh, that I manage actually. Um, and seeing where those barriers really exist, where those sort of structural limitations are, and then translating those into policy uh, recommendations. And you may, uh, people may ha have seen uh, or perhaps not, uh, we at JB did quite a lot of advocacy uh, recently to Oliver Dowden about a cultural recovery, which is just and green. And we made these sort of key asks um, and it's debatable whether they are, are being met, but they still exist um, in the world. And we galvanized a huge amount of um, sort of support and signatories um, against this open open letter and you can read it on our website or on uh, on the guardian um but you know things like ensuring that cultural uh funding um is supportive of environmental action that there are specific research and development funds designated for creative and cultural uh community members and artists that there are more platforms to facilitate um sharing uh, whether that's sharing of resources, sharing of knowledge, sharing of good practices, a bit like what today is, I think, demonstrating. Um, all these kind of asks that are really trying to, I think, make visible what arts and culture is already doing because it's vast and it's quite frequently unrecognized. Um, and there is a lot of, sort of missed um, opportunity or potential. So it's making visible the kind of actions that are there, um, allowing people to access resource to support them and inspiration, and really understanding where these successful models are existing and what would it take to scale them and accelerate them. And actually, I'll, I'll finish there because that's uh, through my sort of um, connection to Laura and Artillery is that Artillery are one of our um, are part of a project that Julie's Bicycle are, worth, um, are, are leading with Arts Council England called Accelerator. And the purpose is uh, trying to sort of uh, build a kind of community of practice around sustainable arts, uh, getting people in the same room together, um, supporting them to develop their leadership competencies and their uh, and, and a kind of particular project. So more things that are building connection that are allowing people to exchange and learn from each other and scale uh, what really uh, works. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lucy. And that, that, I mean, you just did a, a brilliant, um, you know, bringing a brilliant job of bringing us back to the whole point of, of the um, webinar today, which is to look at 
climate change, you know, and how the art world fits into that. And sometimes it's very easy to just get blown away by amazing art and <laughs> forget that, oh, actually, there's a reason for this. You know, we're in this climate emergency. We're in a cli the climate decade now. I mean, I think most people, um, most experts have said that 2050 is not a, a date that is actually going to work in terms of the you know uh, effective reduction in climate emissions I and mean, we've got to work to 2030 so we're in a cl the climate decade of history and and the other thing that you said is is the um, the importance of the accelerator you know so that we can get things to scale because obviously you know so many of us have been working and so many artists are working on a on a very um you know small scale with themselves and, and a few partners but but we've really got to accelerate everything haven't we and and make everything work out how to make how to make system change happen by scaling things up um but we've just got 10 minutes left so i really want to make sure that everybody here has the chance to ask questions of anybody they'd like to ask questions of amongst the panel pursue you know things uh, lines of thought that, that popped up for you during the um, webinar um, are you able to stay with us Lucy or do you have to yeah that's that'd be great great so um, I've I... got a couple of questions yeah great um, that wow. have come through we're yeah. learning this new format so um, because everyone's now on screen <laughs> they can't put questions in the Q&A. Yeah. Um, so I have a question from, um, I have a question from uh, Michelle was asking, are there patterns, um, Olivia and Francesco for your coats, are they available online? Are they, um, are there, possibilities of the workshops happening online. Yeah, Olivia, would you like to respond? Yeah, so I'm actually just finishing a little instruction video that's going to go on YouTube very soon. Um, and so the pattern for the jacket is very, very simple. So it's kind of in the video, I explain how to make your own pattern. Um, yeah, so. And there are also the visual instructions as well. So some uh, visual and video as well to accompany. And uh, yeah, we have also a series of eight workshops coming up, but for now, unfortunately, we, they were about to start in two weeks, but for now we are suspending due to the lockdown. Uh, but yeah, potentially, uh, for now, I think we are creating these resources to make them open accessible for people to do on their own. But of course, yeah, we want to do more of this uh, when time allow. Yes, and I'm kind of trying to maybe organize some Zoom workshops for January and February. So if you go on my website, I have a newsletter. So if you sign up there, then you'll get all the news of videos uploaded mm. or instructions and all of that. Great. Um, so yeah, Laura's just put in a comment saying for all the attendees, if you want to make yourself visible again, you can actually ask your questions in person. Um, otherwise, just to put the questions in the chat and Mara and, or Laura will ask them. So I've had another question from someone who's happy for me to read it, um, who asks, uh, which, um, and I think this is to everybody really, um, what resources and support they are aware of that are available for artists to push their practice in a more sustainable and ecologically sound direction? It's a quick thing I could add there, um, which I, I included the link. Um, Lucy's part of um, Season for Change, and there's a program on now that you can book for with lots of ideas, I think, Lucy. Is that right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you, Laura. Uh, Season for Exchange, it's a sort of two week um, event. And um, there, um, if you go onto the website, there's also a toolkit uh, and that has some resources um, that also looks at artistic practice um, in relation to some of these um, big questions and themes that we've been discussing today. But yeah, sign up, come up. I'm also uh, putting in the chat, uh, so I sent a 
sustainable fashion as well, you can sign up our newsletter. Uh, but also we have the resource page where you can download lots of uh, resources, publications, toolkits, uh, all for free. Um, and I'm also putting specifically the Fashion Futures 2030 toolkit, which is also uh, for free to download. It is aimed both for businesses and for educators. Um, yeah, so I will put more, uh, more links in the chat. Thank you. And I've got a response from Kay Katz saying you'd be happy to offer some insight on that as well. Do you want to make yourself visible, Kay? Can you do that? Or, um... Hi. 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 Nice to see you. Um, yeah, I'm just uh, doing a project at the Leighton Green Studios in the coming weeks. So helping designers kind of tackle their waste and learn how to be more sustainable in their practice. Um, so if you, if Laura, you want to pop over one day, um, and we can like talk about your practice per, like one-to-one -one and see like how you can be more sustainable, or if you want to shoot me an email, I was just going to write my email in the chat, um, and we can talk. Yeah. Do put that in the chat for everybody to see. That's great. Thank you. Did, did, while you're here, do you have a question for anybody or? Um. I think my question was answered earlier about um, the art pieces and um, the processes that she uses. But other than that, I think um, I'm pretty familiar with everything that's going on in Waltham Forest. And um, yeah, it's just really exciting to see everyone's work and, and all the great things everybody is working on. Great, thank you. So we've got a question from um, somebody uh, Galaxy <laughs> asking Sandy if she thinks her school work makes um, helps to make kids aware of the issues. Um, I wondered if you would like to expand on that, Sandy. Are you still here? Can't see your. I can't see Sandy's um, icon. Sandy's here. Sandy's here. <laughs> hi, hi. Ah, there you go. <coughs> So the, did you hear the question? I just wanted to, you to expand on, on the schoolwork and where, how it made kids more aware of climate issues. I know yes, that you um, yes, um, it does. Yes, definitely. Especially when, because a lot of the time we're using plastics that they've brought in from home and the amount of it and ways to use it and just that general awareness of how to think about plastic and think about things that they really need, you know. Um, I think that's, uh, that's, that's a brilliant point, actually, because it brings it back to consumerism, doesn't it? Yeah. And, and children are fed a lifestyle of consumerism. Totally. And to actually get them to uh, understand that it's not an essential part of life no. is really Do, important, I think. Yeah. Do they need those little plastic toys on the front yeah. of magazines? Do they play with them? Do they really need a plastic toy when they have a meal? You know, is that sort of just raising that awareness? And they are usually quite overwhelmed by the amount. And some of the schools I've been into where we've used quite a bit of the plastic that's been left in, the next day, the, uh, the teacher has left it there overnight to make a point that when they come back into school the next day, that that plastic is still there <laughs> you know it, uh, it does doesn't disappear yeah you know, it has to uh, then they get to take it out and put it in the recycle and, you know to think about where it's going yeah so yep. yes I, I believe it does while we're here maybe I can just while we're talking about plastic maybe I can just um put my own two pennies worth in which is that I recently found out about the expanded um, Edmonton incinerator which has permission and apparently 80% of what it well, already burns and will burn is plastic so that that those particulates are going up into the air and they will never decompose and we breathe them no. right in we will breathe them right in and so will our children so anybody who wants to uh campaign against that please go to the stop edmondson incinerator uh, website because i can't think of anything more important in our in our local life than that actually um and we can't just make everything into artwork <laughs> no 
I'd like to point out another of um, people who've influenced me and, and who to join is um, Everyday Plastic, which was uh, set up by Daniel Webb, who collected all his plastic for a whole year and what it was and how it broke down and where it came from and how it was disposed of. And he runs uh, week sessions, week course where you save what plastic you use and then they work out your carbon footprint and how you might reduce that. So I can put a link on. To yeah, do, do, thank you. <laughs> I'm very aware we're at five to four. Can I, I do have another burning question though. Okay, too. okay. Um, and I think it's really pertinent for the sector that we work in. Um, so one of our attendees says, I am currently making more stuff and would like and need to sell it. What is the best way to be culturally, commercially viable, but also environmentally caring? That is a fantastic question to end on. Um, perhaps we could have each uh, speaker give their response. I think it's a really perfect question to end on. Um, uh, do, Francesco, do you want to start? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, it was always my dilemma as well. I was trained in product design and then I didn't want to make more stuff because we don't need. In a way, though, if you make things as well as uh, with making for change for some forests as well in the local community, we in encourage people to make things for themselves by ups uh, upcycling the all the stuff which is already out there. So in that sense, you are not um, taking more and more resources from the environment, but you are just uh, repurposing what's out there. In that sense, I think, I, I think it is environmentally sustainable. Then you also, it's great that you also, as well for me, sustainability, it's, I look at it holistically. So it's uh, environmental, economic, social, and cultural. So as well, uh, we need an interdependence of all the four pillars. So definitely as well, uh, uh, if you make, for example, in, with Forest Codes, for example, it's an uh, initiative that shows how uh, we can create social sustainability by providing women from a disadvantaged background who are in isolation, also an opportunity to come together with their community. And also culturally, as well, we are kind of losing our cultural heritage with this movement of fast fashion and mass uh, production. So as well, bringing about your cultural heritage and what is really spiritual to you, in a way, we are preserving also the craft skills that are disappearing. And finally, I hope that by making things locally and in a smaller scale, we can also make local economy, uh, local economies flourish and be resilient as well. Without, about, for that, we need to put to, um, to shift the narrative from uh, like the lo the growth logic to more to put the earth at the center and like my colleague Kate Fletcher for example uh, is uh, pioneering this movement about uh, earth logic which is all about making uh, earth at the center and uh, and it is about less and uh, localism and all of these approaches. Brilliant, thank you, Francesco. Okay. Um, uh, Olivia, yeah. Yeah, so a really great points, Francesca. I think I agree with all of them, obviously. Um, so kind of from like my personal experience having a business, what you can do, I think, is really shift around your own business model. Like how I changed to a community interest company. So where I know even though I sell products, I do social good in my area. So this connects very much with what, what Francesca said. But then also, um, I think when you make products, what's important is knowing, kind of figuring out, are those products really used? Um, and really creating products that people want. So maybe shifting more towards like a made to order model in your sales so that then really you only take and create what you have to um, or kind of similar things like that, or like batches, selling in batches, maybe like, I don't know if you know, painter jackets, like they do a great job at that as well, where they do sell collections, but in limited editions, and then it's really a wanted product. So I just really think looking into your business model and how can you change it just so that it works and sustains itself. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, before we go into the last few words of Sandy and um, uh, uh, Lucy, um, let me just bring in Charlotte, because I know that she, she's she got a, a question or you'd like to introduce yourself, Charlotte. Can you? Oh, Charlotte's gone. 
Yeah. Can you take yourself off? Yep. Hi, Charlotte. I studio next to Sandy in Blackpool's Lane and I worked with kids in schools for like 20 years and I just mostly was painting but I just wanted to sort of embellish on what Sandy has said about children which is that the more you talk about it while doing it obviously the sort of kinesthetic learning um, the more it goes in and whether we you know mine's more of a sort of visual learning and it's more about the endangered species and talking and painting around with sort of children and global warming and all that sort of thing and that's what I going to primary schools and paint pandas and talk about them and they come out with all these facts to their parents later and talking about the rainforest and I just think kids often, you know, London kids or city kids that have never, you know, I suppose the kids that were like eight and never seen a cow, um, but by, by kind of doing it as opposed to them just seeing videos, I just think it, it makes so much difference. Um, that's what I love working with children really because they do absorb a lot if it's in the right way. And the other thing I just wanted to quickly say was just how I kind of we collaborate with each other more and maybe I need to join more local things because sometimes I feel I'm just here working alone and yeah. So nice to meet everyone and hopefully you all again soon. Well it's great to have you with us. Thank you Charlotte and thanks for introducing yourself. What an amazing picture you've got next to well, you. And I've just finished it with a commission for a child's bedroom of their pet daughter. And I'm having so good. It's gorgeous. <laughs> Thanks and lovely. Thank you. Everything you've all said has been really informative and brilliant. I've really enjoyed it. Well, thanks for introducing yourself. And yeah, I think that is the whole point about artillery is that you, artillery helps, you know, bring artists together in you know, for everybody to support and inspire each other and also to bring in ideas from outside of Waltham Forest, because there is life outside of Waltham Forest, <laughs> um, to, to learn from and give us inspiration. So um, it's great that you're here and yes, do, do um, you know, there, will, there are more of these um, climate creative talks um, coming up. And in a second, Laura will will um, just go over those. So we've gone over time. I'm really sorry, everybody. But if 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 um, Sandy and um, Lucy wanted to say a few last words, then please do. Sandy. And I think you'd like to share before we leave. You don't have to at all. Yes, that's no, okay. I was just getting my my sign. Can you find oh, no. me? Stand up. Yes. Um, no, mine would be just uh, to actually, you know, to be doing something is much better than to uh, keep, you know, your anxieties buried and anger. That, you know, it's actually easier to get up and get on and be doing things. And for... That is very you know, sound advice. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you reuse what's already available. Don't you know, so we don't have to pillage Earth's natural resources anymore. If we Thank you. And find yeah. outlets to promote those. Thank you. Um, before I go to Lucy, I'm just I'm just trying to work out what Carolyn's trying to say. <laughs> Did you want to say anything, Carolyn, or are you just? Is there a question? Or have I missed anybody's questions? Uh, no, I was just saying thank you. Oh, thank you. Just saying thank you. <laughs> So Carolyn asked the question about, as a producer, how do you cope with that um, perpetual conundrum of making oh, right. more stuff? Yes. Um, I yes. think it's a really valid question, and I suspect everyone may have experienced a bit of a block because of it at yeah. some point. Yeah, absolutely. Lucy, you must come across that all the time. Do you want to... Uh... To sign off and maybe address that last point how do oh. how are makers and creatives uh, able to make and create without actually producing stuff more stuff well there isn't necess necessarily the, uh, uh, a, a sort of one answer uh, to that I think yeah. uh, my fellow panelists have already explored quite a few of those um, issues in terms of how you think about your own uh, business or your own practice, uh, where you source your materials from, who you work with, what your messaging is. I think 
you know, we these are all difficult questions that we're all asking ourselves. Um, we can try and uh, understand what our impacts are. We can mitigate them where possible. We can use our platforms to discuss these issues, to uh, to sort of build a, a kind of community and networked responses to host conversations. Um, but you know, ultimately, everything that we do does carry an impact. That is the sort of the nature of, of being alive. So I think it is to be as conscious as we can, use our opportunities as artists, as community mediators, uh, where we can, and um, and focus on sort of the, the resilience agenda. I think that um, is is so important. I really agree with everything. Uh, uh, Francesco is saying um, and, uh, and other panelists, I really think sort of localism um, is going to be um, more important, uh, especially also in social distance times. Um, so I think uh, for me, resilience in a sense is a really kind of a powerful term to think about uh, all these different issues as well. Unfortunately, you, there you. is a lot of damage that is already locked into our system. But resilience is a way of thinking about how do we also support people in our communities around the world to deal with the with our kind of changing planet as well. That's a perfect way to end. Thank you so much, Lucy. And resilience is is certainly uh, well, it, it's the answer to a lot of things, and it's it's what we have going in Waltham Forest in in bucket loads in terms of um, well just just forging the connections which I think are going to to help us be that resilient community and and um, and I think that's a perfect place to end but I'm going to pass over to Laura um, but first of all I just want to say thank you so much to all our attendees and obviously thank you so much to all our panelists because you're amazing and it, even though we couldn't be with you all together in uh, Gnome House. It was it was brilliant to see see your artwork, hear your stories, and um, and just have that inspiration on a Saturday afternoon. So thank you. Um, but I'll hand back to Laura. Thank you so much for chairing so skillfully, Sue. Um, and I'm really glad so many of you um, asked brilliant questions and got involved in the best way we can online. Um, so yes, we're in Gnome House and Blackfoot Lane. We'll be here again on the 21st of November for our next panel. Um, so I hope some of you will join us. And again, on the 6th of February for the 3rd. If you have anyone locally um, that you would love to hear from, do let me know, make us aware of what they're working on because we can evolve the programme um, to fit what's happening. And um, as I'm sitting here, people have been opening a door to say hello, if you could hear background noise, um, which, you know, kind of brings home to me how important it is that we connect. Um, so we're trying to work out how to do hybrid events and the technology involved, and we're working on it in amongst all the other considerations um, so everyone can participate. So thank you all again very, very much. Um, I'll stop the recording. Please, if you'd like to go and with Fresh yourselves and leave fine or if you'd like to make yourselves visible and chat amongst yourselves then that would be great and um, I'm feeling very moved and um, quite quite inspired so thanks again. <laughs> Thank you for organizing it by the way and inviting us. <laughs> Thank you for being here. And also <laughs> didn't you want to announce that you had achieved a cultural recovery fund as well it's a great achieve achievement to continue support the great work you do I think it was worth a mention. <laughs> Oh, Francesco, thank you. Um, it means a lot to us to have our work valued in that way um, when everyone is facing, you know, unbelievable challenges. So, yeah, we'll be putting together a programme um, for the next six months of um, activities that are about inclusion and equity um, and sustaining our organisation. Um, looking forward to festivals next summer and how we involve as many people as we can so yeah and I'll, I'll share all of the links in the chat that we've um, gleaned from you all I'll, I'll send that round to you all afterwards um, if you wanted actually to share your details with other attendees or you know work that seems fitting for our discussion today just pop it all in the chat and I'll, I'll circulate it afterwards so thank you <laughs> thank you Laura 
Thank you, everybody. Mm.